This week on x Charlie is a jerk, Dwayne is berserk, we see the peens of Mulder and Kirk! It's the Red Hot Pants episode! Welcome to x a podcast where we introduce each other to our fandoms one episode at a time. I'm your host, Aaron Klein, an X-Files spooky bitch. And I'm your other host, Stella Cheeks, a slut for Star Trek The Original Series. Each podcast, we pick two episodes that fit a cinematic theme, watch them together, and then record our feelings. Our theme this week is Red Hot Pants. No, seriously, that's the theme. <laughs> it's gonna be a fucking weird one. <laughs> <laughs> Look... I had no idea what to do with this episode. Charlie X is so early and so weird, and I also don't really like it that much. And so when we half-heartedly like joked about doing a Red Hot Pants episode, I was like, yes, actually, please. Yes, that's the theme. Let's just do it. Who cares? Not only do we get to see Captain Kirk shirtless and in hot red pants, we get to see several of the crewmen strutting their stuff. It's almost enough to make this episode enjoyable for me. Almost. And listen, did we pick these episodes and themes specifically because of the famous red bathing suit that Mulder wears in season two episode? Dwayne Barry? Uh, da da, yes, definitely. That's a theme. The very short shot of Mulder getting out of the pool in his teeny tiny little red bikini bottoms is one of the most iconic and famous scenes from the series and is called back to both in the series and for the rest of David Duchovny's career, including most recently in the series The Chair, and really only exists because Fox understood that women and gays watch this show. David Duchovny's hot, take his clothes off and make him soaking wet, and thus the birth of a thousand fanfics between him and Krychek is born. Also, this is Stella's first time meeting Krychek. Also, this is a two-part episode, so we get some real good skin mint, and this is fucking nuts. Yay! <laughs> Finally, first appearance of Daddy in season, season two! two. <laughs> yeah, both these episodes are quite serious, and we chose uh, Red Hop <laughs> theme so for the rest of this season of extract season two we've been like shoehorning <laughs> things into the theme and for this one we just shoehorned this theme and we were like <laughs> red hot pants and then we watched these episodes and we're like uh-oh well you wanted to fit in Dwayne Barry and couldn't really figure out how to do it and I was having a hard time placing Charlie X and so when we made this joke we were like wait a minute <laughs> Hmm. Actually, this does do these two episodes into the same sort of. <laughs> yeah, and both men showing their peens and red pants birthed a lot of fanfic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's, the, that's part of the mythos of this whole fucking show. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, we're good at podcasting. Yeah, really good at podcasting. Also, <laughs> y'all are about to be in for a wild ride of summaries for this one. <laughs> Speaking of, let's just get it out of the way with Dig It In There, Mr. Spock. I'd like you to give him the necessary medical orientation on the problems of uh, uh, adolescence. Well, don't you think it'd be better for a strong father image like you? He already looks the, up uh, to The job is yours, Bowen. Flattery will get you nowhere. Actually, a pretty quick episode summary Great. comparatively <laughs> for me. <laughs> The Enterprise crew take charge of Charlie Evans, the sole survivor of a transport ship that crashed 14 years ago on the planet Phasis. Charlie grew up alone, stranded, and this is the first time since the crash that he's interacted with humanoids. As such, he's a fucking antisocial and weird as hell. But hey, everybody is understanding because you'd be weird too if you were raised completely alone and learned how to talk from the ship's computers, right? Well, thank God they are taking him to a colony and he won't be their problem for long. In the meantime, he just wants people to be nice to him. It's not weird. Kirk immediately is annoyed by Charlie, but tries to be understanding, if by trying to be understanding means pawning him off on literally everybody else. (laughs) Unfortunately for Janice Rand, Charlie imprints on her because she's the first girl he's ever seen. What's a girl? (laughs) She does her best to show him around and be polite, even indulges in his magic tricks when she would rather be listening to a hero's truly incredible singing. But when he makes things creepy, because, well, he's a creep, she asks Kirk to intervene. But she doesn't want to break his heart. Also, she has half a brain and is uncomfortable as hell around him. Kirk thinks it's just adolescent weirdness, but agrees to have a chat with Charlie. He tries to explain consent to Charlie. It doesn't go great. And then distracts him by teaching him how to fight. Cue all the hot red pants. Charlie isn't a great fighter. I mean, not everyone can just flop around like Captain Kirk. That takes skill. And he gets annoyed when a crewman laughs at him. Using previously unknown powers, Charlie makes the man disappear, and Kirk realizes that Charlie is extremely dangerous. Not only is he an unbalanced 17-year-old that has been raised with no authority structure, but he's an unbalanced 17-year-old that has been raised with no authority structure, and he has godlike powers. Fun! 
Spock, Kirk, and McCoy deduce that the Thasians, mythologized to have had such powers, must have raised him. They also realize that the Antares, the ship that brought Charlie to them, didn't blow up due to a malfunction, but that Charlie destroyed the ship to prevent them from communicating with them. Kirk tries to confine Charlie, but Charlie rebels and begins to use his transmutation and telepathy powers freely to control the ship and make several of the crew disappear, including Janice Rand. Kirk tries to take Charlie out, but even with his powers taxed, he bests Kirk. The Enterprise is saved when the Thasians catch up to the ship. They restore the Enterprise and her crew and explain that their race gave Charlie his powers so that he could survive on the world, but these powers make him too dangerous to live among humans. Kirk argues that he could be taught to control the powers and that he belongs with his own kind, but the Thasians disagree and take him back. Ultimately, the crew can do nothing to save Charlie and are left with the echoes of his final cry, I want to stay, 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 to haunt their dreams. <laughs> no space laughter. No space laughter. The opposite of space laughter. Like the most space serious ending I think I've seen yet. Episode two. <laughs> this is quite an episode two. Yeah, they were like, ooh, ooh uh, this one, uh, this one's done on time. Mm, we don't think this should be episode two, but we don't have anything else to show because this one's done on time. Okay. <laughs> Which is literally what happened. <sighs> so what do you think? Ah. Uh... <laughs> I don't I don't know what I thought. Yeah, this I, is a hard one. This is a hard one. This is like kind of low-key horrifying in yeah. like lots of ways, especially in the back half. Right. And near the end, from the moment Charlie like starts to fully release his powers to the end, it's like it, it's a horror episode. Yeah. Like it's horrifying because he's a, a creep for most of the episode. And you, we, the audience, are aware that he has powers before like everybody else does, basically. Creepy and, undertaker eye powers. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, well, I have this knowledge and I know that he's a creep and I know that he's imprinting on Rand, which is like freaky. And there's this like kind of. Uh, hovering idea of sexual assault that like never really happens but is like really clear <laughs> that that's right. like a possibility that could happen at any moment which sucks yeah and puts her in like a really like like she's trying like it's so hard because like everyone's trying to have sympathy for him because like it's an impossible situation right like he's been alone for 14 years he hasn't interacted with anybody he doesn't have any authority structures of course he doesn't know how to interact with people he's going through puberty but also like he's a creep he's a terrifying psycho in lots of ways yeah. and the uh, you described it before we watched it as like he's a weird incel and that's sort of what it feels like but it's way worse than oh that. yeah because he has magic powers and not like the idea with an incel, too, is that they have this, like, entitlement about what uh, other people should do for them and how they should and treat them. what they're owed by society. Right. And he has no concept of society, of what people should be like, like, being dropped into society and, like... I don't want anyone to react to me in a way that's unfamiliar to me, but everything is unfamiliar to me is so fucking volatile and dangerous that it was fascinating. But then especially as he starts to like really lose it and starts to use his powers, like truly horrifying shit he does to other people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, but like, it's really uncomfortable to watch because that's an uncomfortable concept, right? Like a, yeah, young adolescents who a young male adolescent who has these godlike powers and like no morality and no structure yeah. and like and is overwhelmed by puberty like that is terrifying that is horrifying um, it's very lord of the flies yeah like this idea of if you leave a young boy alone what will happen to his brain kind of and like lord of the flies is obviously different because it's a group of young boys and how they interact together and what that like social chemistry does if you let the worst impulses run wild but this is sort of that same idea of it's his worst impulses he's been given godlike powers no but, guidance on how to control them right. at all. Because he was given godlike powers, but he was never a threat to the Thasians. So they like right. all, they also were like, well, we don't want you to die. So here's these powers. But like we're also intangible and don't really know how to react to, interact with you. And also you're not a threat to us. So LOL, like 
we don't gotta worry about you. Like they didn't right. know that he would like left the world, and they were like, "Oh right. shit, he left. Oh shit, we have to get yeah, him like, back." The fact that they immediately, as soon as they realize he's gone, are like, "Oh fuck, we have got to retrieve this child." Like we we created this monster, and we cannot unleash it among actual people because he's not. He even says himself, he's not really a human anymore. Right. Like he exists on a different plane than them both because he has these godlike powers, but also because he has no human conditioning at all. It's like when you find a feral child in the woods where it's like, can you really integrate somebody who's been raised in the woods alone by animals into society? Like, kind of, but... They ha- you have to put a shitload of work in and like it's one thing if you're a feral child who like attacks a doctor in a hospital it's another thing if you can blow a fucking ship up with your brain yeah. like it's rough but also there's these like very like you said before we started watching there's these very nuanced layers to it of like Kirk trying to teach him about consent and like the idea of all adolescents are fucking psychos and right. like you're ruled by these emotions you can't understand and like you have to teach all adolescents about what's appropriate and what's moral and and like interaction between male friends is different than how you interact between a man and a woman or between someone that you are attracted to. And like Kirk trying to teach him about consent is very interesting, especially for the 60s. It feels very progressive. Also, I think, too, just as somebody who constantly feels like I have to defend Kirk, the fact that Kirk is like being having a crush on somebody being in love with somebody that's a two way street like right. he specifically is like it's not just about what you want right exactly like, he's not a creep Kirk is not a creep yeah <laughs> and like I think too that Kirk takes the time where he's like I'm gonna teach you how to fight because that's important for you to learn how to defend yourself and Charlie's like okay but I wanna learn how, teach me how to fight like actually fight and Kirk's like okay but you have to learn how to fall you have to learn how to roll you have to learn how when you're hit to take that before you can learn how to dish that out because uh, you can't again it's like a two way street he's trying to teach him about two way communication between people and like the first thing you have to do is learn how to protect yourself and then that's how you learn how to protect other people also and like Charlie has no concept for any of that and like being laughed at is this horrible thing to him because yeah, he's I just never want people to be nice to me. And McCoy's like, yeah, I mean, like everybody wants that. Like, yeah, relax, exactly. He's like, he's like, do you like me? And McCoy's like, every seventeen-year-old wants people to like them. And but, but no, I do not. <laughs> yeah, I, but they all tread this very fine line where they they're trying to be so empathetic about the fact that this child has been raised alone. And yet are also like slowly becoming aware of the horror that they've allowed onto their ship. Right. And it puts Kirk in like this really. A hard moral quandary at the end where he's like, I mean, he should be with his people. Right. Like, I feel like we're doing the wrong thing by abandoning him, but also like, A, we can't really put up a huge fight because these people are so much more powerful than us, but also like, how much of a fight do I put up? Because they're also right. Yeah, like we, they even say like, we can't release him into a populized like colony. There's no way. Like, if he can do this much damage on a ship floating in the middle of space, imagine what he could do to a whole world. Of it's people. like that Twilight Zone episode with that little boy who like sends people off or whatever. Like, it's that same like if you give a godlike power to a child or to an adolescence with like an unformed brain, like that's not good. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It was uh, <laughs> to go into it knowing. Literally only that there were going to be red hot pants in this episode. It was like, what the fuck am I watching right now? I did really enjoy the red hot pants scene just to take it back to what our actual theme for this episode is. I liked that. That was like, oh, hey, here's all these women in Lycra. They're doing flips. Ooh, here's some gladiator men in like hot pants. Oh, they're wearing keys. That's pretty cool. And then there's Kirk's whole dick. Cool. Fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, I just have when I part of the reason I was like, oh, I don't. I don't know what to do this episode because there are like a handful of episodes that I like don't like. And I think because I've watched this like twice this week to like prepare. I think I have like a new like respect for this episode because I usually skip over it because I don't like it that much. And so early it doesn't really mean anything to me. But like I don't think I will ever enjoy watching this episode because the source material or the concept is just really ick like we talked about. But it's really well written. Yeah. It's pretty nuanced. Written by DC Fontana. Like, I feel like you can tell, especially Janice's lines, that it was written by a woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incredibly well acted. Like, the actor that they got to play Charlie, 
does a great job. Really good. Yeah, like he I agree. is good at the like isolation and also like the like temper tantrums feel real. And you can also he is sympathetic in a lot of ways when he's like talking to Kirk and it's like Janet's, I mean, Yeoman or like like he's trying to say the right thing. He's trying to do the right thing. He kind of is trying to live up to Captain Kirk until he gets mad and snaps. But like you see him trying, he just doesn't have those, you know, you can't checks teach, and balances built in. You don't teach a baby to be a person in a week. Right. Like, and especially a baby that can talk back and like interact and doesn't remember what it's like to live with other humans. Like socialization is a process that takes like decades and he's just being dropped into it. And so you're right. I Like you do feel this sympathy for him. And then he, and even in those last moments where he says like, I, you I can't go live with them. I can't feel them. I can't touch them. They're, I can't interact with them in this way. I'm just, he's like basically communicating, I'm just going to be alone until I die. And, well, then, and also that's, that's not helping the situation. Like people need to be humans. Humanoids need to be touched, need to like mm-hmm. be socialized in a specific way. So like, of course he's even more crazy. Right. <laughs> Although I wonder too, like they gave him this power. Like, can he create like, Oh, almost like androids like know, now that he's seen people and the way that they move and he can like visualize it in his brain can he create using the resources of this planet people that he can touch and interact with yeah i wonder i mean he like a part uh in the episode like he creates matter yeah like he makes like a perfume or something for janice he like fucks around with the cards and stuff like right. he can manipulate and create matter so they like said that's how he's been feeding himself as he creates food yeah. the, which is nutritional enough that he it has kept him alive for 14 years so i like he also talks about how the ship that he that crashed that he was on still had the memory banks. And so he was like, I, the other ship, sorry. Yeah. The, the one that he crashed on had the memory banks. And so like, I can talk to them and they can talk back and like, okay, well now that you understand how people move and look and function, can you create a person and put these memory banks inside of them, which we like, don't get an answer for, but in my brain, I'm like, maybe that's better. Like maybe we're not just abandoning this child on this. Like you are planet like yeah it's fucked up there's like not a good resolution which is part of the reason why it feels like a true horror episode at the end there's some horrific like sight horrors like the thing where the woman's like face is covered over which is like not a thing that i enjoyed watching yeah but the like torture and stuff and like the woman who like ages and stuff like that's all really horrifying like that's classic horror shit but then to have this like not open ended. This just like ambiguous like ending. This like existential unsa- horror. Yeah, yeah, this unsatisfying ending. Yeah, it's totally existential horror. Like what? What is the right there philosophical is no ra- horror too? Like there's no right answer here. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it feels weird too because at the beginning it's like okay this kid's a creep but it's very lighthearted in many ways. Because right, like, people are like of course he would be a fucking weirdo. He's lived alone. Like we right. just have to deal with this weirdo. And like they're in the like recreational lounge and like her singing and they're having this like great time. Spock is smiling and playing the like mandolin or whatever the fuck it is. And it's, it's not like, creepy. Yeah. <laughs> like it's weird to see Spock like jolly and having a good time so too they're still figuring shit out man but he doesn't feel creepy in the same way that he does in other early episodes when they right. have him smile and I so think it's because feels... he has like a it's still like a bitchiness underneath it's like a fine i will like he's sassy yeah, yeah. so like it still feels spock like a, yes. a bitchy smile it doesn't feel as like hey a flower yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and and it feels like it's also used really well in that scene because it's in like direct contrast with how sullen and creepy Charlie is in that yeah. moment too. So it doesn't feel like totally out of nowhere. It's just what a weird fucking episode. Weird episode. <laughs> I love that rec- recreation scene so much. Like, I think originally when we were trying to fit this in, I had this under like a theme of like singing, which I don't even think we have that theme anymore because I was like, I don't know what to do with this because we have other like child ones and whatever. But I specifically, that's a really iconic scene, obviously, because like Nichelle Nichols like is known for like singing and stuff. But it's it's such a fun scene because you get to see the crew relaxing and you get to see a lot of 
background crew relaxing, right? Because we've seen them relax in like troubles, troubles and stuff. But this is a lot of like people just chilling and whatever. Yeah. And, you know, there is a camaraderie and an, like it's an atmospheric. They're not like all kind of on their own like high school lunch. And you get the sense that Uhura does this a lot because you can the idea is that she's making up a song on the spot for one of the crewmen. And there's actually like an apocrypha note where there was like a line that was taken out where somebody where she was about to sing and like was like taking like improv suggestions basically and somebody was like do Captain Kirk she's like oh, I've already done Captain Kirk I'm like I'm gonna do Spock and like Spock's like fine I'll play along with you or whatever yeah. but I also think that scene is important too in terms of the episode because like Charlie comes in and Char- and Ahura includes Charlie yeah they and, like, try calls him, yeah like say oh Charlie's our new darling and like and Janice is like creeped out by him but also has like a lot of empathy for him and yeah. like is trying to teach him and like is like, hey, this is a, a 17 year old just like you. Why don't you talk to her? Not me. I am inappropriate. Like I'm right. an adult and this is not going to work. And even when she's telling Kirk, like, I need you to step in. Like, I can't I don't want to be somebody who like breaks his heart, but also like this feels like it could go further than that. And at first, Kirk kind of like brushes her off and she's like, no, I need you to do this. And he like to his credit is like, OK, I'm like, yeah, I, I see what you're laying down. I will go take care of this. Like right. Janice really tries. And a thing that I was telling you a uh, uh, context of like us recording, I was like, I like that we do extra is I have like a whole new appreciation for like the character of Janice Rand. Like, mm-hmm. obviously, like my shipper hackles are like, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> Because, like, I hate the idea of her, like, being, you know, a a love interest or whatever. But taking that out of the equation, like, she's very competent at her job. She's, like, really interacts with the rest of the crew in, like, a lovely way. Like, the Mm -hmm. way she, like, clearly is friends with everybody in the rec room. She cares about Charlie. Like, that's what a yeoman does, right? Like, they help make sure the ship runs properly. And I think had awful real world stuff not happen it would have been really interesting to see how she would have continued to exist in the show like long term yeah so i'm just even though this episode is creepy i think she does a really particularly good job Mm -hmm. i think this that's what's hard about this episode i don't want to go out of my way to watch this episode but i think it is a very well written and well acted yeah episode i do think it is a good episode yeah and we both said, too, at the very end, there's that really great moment between Bones and Yam and Rand where Charlie's, like, yeah. really trying to appeal to her. And it's it's a little unclear if she's moving because she feels empathy for him or if he's pulling her towards him. Oh, I didn't even think about that part. I always read it as, like, empathy. But, like, that is an interesting read. Because she almost seems like she's moving without her own control and she looks startled when Bones like he just like gently scoops her back and right. like pulls on it's her very arm. protective like you know yeah. you're with us like right I'm not letting him mess with you or anything happen to you and it's, right. it's like a very low key sweet moment yeah I really enjoyed that I also really liked it like in addition to the rec scene with Uhura every time she's in the same room with Charlie she just has this like bitch don't fuck with me energy where it's like I know what you are and I don't give a fuck and like really stands in defiance in that way where like she's at the panel and he like fucks her shit up and she's like nah I'm still here doing my job and he comes in and she looks very like she doesn't look afraid of him ever but she more presents in like she being Ahura yeah Ahura presents in this like I know this kid is fucking this shit up and I'm still gonna do my job and we're gonna get where we need to get alive. Uhura is competent as hell. Yeah. And so even like as the episode that's presented second in the series, it's nice to see immediately that Uhura is presented that way. Yeah. Some like mythology, apocrypha, whatever, whatever. So obviously like just to talk about the red pants. Those have obviously made it into a lot of fanfics and there's some excellent red pants fan art. I suggest you look for it. <laughs> but also that the idea of the ship's gymnasium was supposed to be like a recurring thing. And that's part of the reason why they have all of those like shots of like gymnastics and people in the background because they were that's like with stock footage that they wanted to use. And so it was supposed to be like a recurring thing, but and it just like never was. So, I don't know. Interesting. Well, you'll see in other series, if you continue to watch, like, they do a lot of working out in, like, they do, like, a ridiculous amount of working out in TNG, actually. But it's always, like, in the holodeck. Like, they'll go in the holodeck and be mm-hmm. like, load, wharf, fucking up a planet, program three. <laughs> That's my <laughs> my made-up thing. <laughs> or, like, Bev and Troy will stretch each other out. Oh, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen that, yes. 
Um, that makes sense. Like that's, right. that's what happens in like real military, space travel. Right? It's both the military and real space travel because if you don't continue to condition your body, you'll get fucked up in space. And especially like trying to do any kind of like mission, you have to remain in good shape. And so it makes sense that like in theory, people are working out all the time. Yeah. Also, Kirk has this line where he's like, Spock is working out. Something, something, something. Working out a program for Charlie to become a human being. I, I was like, is Spock working out? And we're like talking about Spock working out. But I assume Spock also works yeah, out at of some course. point. Well, yeah. Vulcans have like a, I can't remember the name of it, but they have like a traditional pseudo yoga, pseudo like Tai Chi. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see Michael do it in Discovery. And I think you see Spock do it in Discovery too. So like they have like their own, which would make sense if they're all about logic. Like it's logical to like work your body out and have yeah. prime nutrition. And so it makes sense. This, like I said earlier, was originally supposed to be later in the series because NBC thought it felt too much like a teenage melodrama, but it was so cheap to produce because it was just inside the ship mm-hmm. that it like just got bumped up and got done faster. So they were like, well, I'm this one, I guess, which I think it's really interesting because you haven't seen the actual pilot and you haven't seen the thing that the episode that was supposed to be the pilot. But if you think about these three episodes, and I think I think where No Man Has Gone Before might even be three. I'm, I'm not totally sure. Those are all weirdly like horror episodes. So, so it's so like they have sci fi bents or whatever. But like like the first one, the man trap, which we're going to watch spoiler, I think next season. But the theme for that is vampires <laughs> like and then it's just really Ooh. interesting that like if you were watching it in premiere day order, you would be like, is this a sci fi show or is this like a horror show? Weird. Which I think is very interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Especially because there are like a lot of very funny episodes yeah. too. Oh, that's so bizarre. That's what happens when you're it's just episodic and they just shoot it and they're like, I don't know, put it in this order. <laughs> during the first uh so this is like during the first couple episodes, right? And the cinematographer Jerry Finnerman was encouraged to maximize placement of colored background lighting and add exotic warmth to the gray walls, which is part of the reason why Star Trek is so colorful, because NBC was like, we're doing a show in space. Make it so colorful. And that's why all of the ridiculous color blocking happened. So that was set, they set the stage early. Because when we saw the like the pilot or the pilot inside the pilot, like it's colorful, but it's a lot more muted. Right, yeah. Like they wore those like yellowy turtlenecks, were, which were actually worn in this. Charlie wears one and the yeah. Antares crew. They were like, I don't know, just reuse the, the uniforms we don't use anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I also liked the like dramatic eye lighting that they did. Yeah. There was a lot of that in this and it, it was such a strong choice. And I thought it worked really well. I feel like usually when we see that dramatic eye lighting, it's like lovey eye or lovey yeah. light. And this was like spooky, scary. Yeah. Especially because the way that the actor who plays Charlie shows that he's doing it, it's like very heavy like brow and eye acting. So to like highlight that is a really good like cinematographer choice. Mm -hmm. The galley chef was voiced by Gene Roddenberry, which is his only acting role in Star Trek. Oh, interesting. (laughs) Just a fun uh, fact. So, and finally, like this is the first of six original series episodes that takes place entirely aboard the Enterprise. So we've seen a couple of them. We've seen this one, The Changeling, Journey to Babel, which we just saw. Elan of Troyes, which we're watching later this season. Is There No Truth in Beauty? God, is there no truth in... Right, is there... In truth, truth, no beauty. Is there in truth, no beauty? God damn it. I'm like looking at the words. It's never going to... It's never going to go. Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, which we've also watched. The Doomsday Machine, The Ultimate Computer, The Immunity Syndrome, and The Tholian Web. So we've actually seen a lot of the like yeah. closed set Enterprise ones already, which yeah. is interesting. It is interesting. Yeah, that's it. That's all I got. This weird ass episode weird with some ass. really iconic, I- interesting scenes. Like we see Uhura sing in this one. She like, in Star Trek V, the most underrated Star Trek movie. <laughs> she has a great scene where she's doing burlesque naked singing in the desert baller yeah it's great (laughs) ready for a synopsis showdown i guess Ah, this is terrible the only thing worse than a 17 year old boy is a 17 year old boy with godlike powers and no respect for authority (laughs) that's pretty good the creepiest child alive comes on board the ship Menaces everyone, causes general destruction, and when even Kirk in his red-hot pants can't teach him about <laughs> consent, he gets taken against his will back to live with the ghost people. Yeah, we should have chose this for ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> this would be a better ghost one, actually. Hey, they were supposed to be ghosts in space. Gene Roddenberry said no. They're technically ghosts in space. Red-hot pants! <laughs> Red-hot pants! <laughs> 
<laughs> you ready? We did it. <laughs> you ready for Scully? It's me. I am. We stopped to do a Freudian analysis. Next thing we know, we've got four dead hostages. So whatever crap you got to make up about spacemen or UFOs, just keep him on the phone. All right. Here's a not at all quick summary of these two episodes. Yeah, turn my mic on. <laughs> I can slurp over here. Uh, all right. Dwayne Barry and Ascension. Here we go. Dwayne Barry. Dwayne Barry is abducted from his home. Flash forward eight years later, and he is a patient in a mental hospital where he refuses to take his medicine, insists that the aliens are coming back from him, flips out, attacks a security guard, and takes his doctor hostage, hoping to exchange him with the aliens to save himself from being abducted again. However, since he can't actually remember where his abduction site is, he winds up in a travel agency holding the agents and his doctor hostage. And who are you going to call when an alien abductee is holding a bunch of people hostage? Why, none other than Agent Fox Mulder, a man with literally zero hostage (laughs) negotiation training who is ready to fuck this shit up immediately. Mulder, very bad at pretending to be a hostage negotiator, gives up the ghost and Dwayne Barry figures out that he's only being used to gain his trust. A power outage causes Barry to flip out and shoot one of the hostages. Mulder then goes undercover as a paramedic another thing he's not terribly good at as Barry agrees to let the wounded hostage out only exchange for Mulder Scully shows up and tells everyone that when Barry was shot in the head in 1982 it damaged his frontal cortex turning him into a pathological liar Mulder plays into Barry's delusions and gets him to agree to release two more of the hostages one of which who's like hey by the way I agree with everything you said and they're like okay goodbye But when Mulder starts to question Barry about whether he's lying, Barry becomes enraged and tries to attack Mulder, only to be shot by a sniper. Hooray! The next day, Mulder goes to visit Barry in the hospital and is told that all the medical signs Barry said would be there from the alien abductions and tests were in fact present. Don't know why that woman told Mulder that. That was a terrible idea. And they've discovered a piece of metal embedded in Barry's abdomen exactly where he said it would be. Mulder gives this to Scully, who for some reason decides to run it over a grocery store scanner and discovers that the metal has a serial number attached to it. When Scully calls Mulder later from her house to explain this, she opens her blinds and, Gotcha, bitch! It's Dwayne Barry! There to abduct her. End of episode! Episode 2, Ascension. At the start of the next episode, Mulder listens to Scully's voicemail, freaks out, and rushes over to Scully's house to examine the scene. He runs into her mother, who tells him that she had a dream about Dana being taken. Mulder goes into work the next day for a briefing meeting about their plan to search for Scully, and Skinner tells him in no uncertain terms that he's too close to this and needs to go home. Mulder, obviously, ignores this completely, watching over footage of Barry murdering a police officer with Scully in the trunk, confirming that she's alive. After listening to tapes of the talk Mulder had with Barry, well, he was doing a very bad job being a paramedic slash hostage negotiator, Mulder realizes that Barry has taken Scully to Skyland Mountain, ascending to the stars, ostensibly to bribe the aliens to take her instead of him. Crycheck, little bitch that he is, goes, to <laughs> Mal- goes with Mulder but is informing on him the whole time, trying to impede his progress as they are chasing after Barry and Scully. When they arrive at Skyland Mountain, Mulder intimidates the Skyline operator into letting him on the train to the top of the mountain to head off Barry and Scully who are driving up. The operator tells Mulder that he has to be careful because this line is new and they don't know if it'll hold, so Mulder immediately maxes the car out and nearly... <laughs> Jumps it off the track. Crycheck, little bitches as usual, and knocks the operator out, eventually killing him, stops the train, and traps Mulder. However, Mulder Mulder's hard as hell and climbs on top of the tram, nearly falling to his death when Crycheck restarts the tram. Mulder makes it to the top of the mountain, but he's too late because a flash of light happens and Barry starts hooting and hollering that it worked and the aliens took Scully instead of him. Back at the mountain lodge base, Mulder interrogates Barry and flips the fuck out and nearly strangles him to death because he's just very concerned about his platonic partner, no weird stuff. He excuses himself <laughs> and tells Krychek no one is to enter the room which of course Krychek ignores and like five seconds later after Skinner arrives to give Mulder a stern talking to Barry dies of unknown causes Krychek meets with Cigarette Smoking Man and suggests they kill Mulder but Cigarette Smoking Man tells him they can't t- risk turning one man's religion into a crusade and that he can make other arrangements if Krychek can't get his bitch ass in order <laughs> later Skinner tells Mulder that he and Krychek have to undergo a lie detector test in order to confirm their version of what happened but first Mulder takes Krychek's car in order to go talk to his senator friend and is told by X that he can't do anything for him and that the policy now is to deny everything Mulder discovers the cigarettes in Krychek's car and submits a report to 
Skinner that Crycheck is a little bitch and he's responsible for all this shit, including the death of the tram operator who is now missing. Skinner is like, okay, listen, you gotta give me some facts. Calls Crycheck into his office only to discover that he's gone MIA and his home number has been disconnected. Skinner reopens the X-Files in retaliation and Mulder storms out like a little baby. Finally, Mulder meets with Dana's mom to try to give her the cross necklace that Dana wore when they were discovered in the trunk of Barry's car and like, also, isn't she a skeptic? LOL, what's with the cross since Mulder can literally never resist a dig at religion. <laughs> Mrs. Scully tells Mulder that she gave it to Dana on her 15th birthday and he should hold on to it t- until they find her, which he does by wearing it until she comes back and their relationship is definitely platonic and he's for sure not totally in love with her already. Okay, damn. Mulder then returns <laughs> to St- <laughs> Mulder then returns to Skyland Mountain to stare at the stars and be sad. The end. Also, the red hot pants happen literally at the very beginning of Dwayne Barry. The end. Wow. That's you, it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> hey you barely took a breath there was a lot <laughs> i know i just like i'm impressed i've written that much and it took me like 15 minutes to read it <laughs> i like Mulder, have one speed and it's 30 <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of these episodes I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>! <laughs> I think here's what I know. The guy that plays Dwayne Barry is a very good actor. Yes. That was great. Mrs. Fredrickson from Warehouse 13 was really good. Yes. <laughs> well, I love that Warehouse 13 is like a touchstone for me. I'm like, oh, her, him from Warehouse 13. Nothing else. <laughs> I'm very happy to see Daddy back. Yeah. First appearance, season two, extra. Crytek's a little bitch. He is a little bitch. I do not understand the like thirst for him. No. I mean, obviously, not. like if you're like, if uh, the type of man I thirst for is Mitch Bellucci, obviously, I'm not going to go for the actor who plays Crytek. Yeah. Those are different vibes. <laughs> I feel like everybody understands that. Yes. I I think that David Duchovny was r- really superb in both of these episodes. Like, I don't know how I necessarily feel about them, like, plot-wise and stuff. And I understand that they were doing some stuff so that they could, like, she could have her pregnant belly. And, like, it just also is kind of weird to be, like, season two, alien baby, okay. <laughs> but I think that, especially for, like, an episode where Mulder's doing a bunch of crazy shit, I think that David Duchovny, like, acts it really subtly. Yeah. And does a really good job. Because in the beginning, he's, like, struggling with the, like, is Dwayne Barry telling the truth? I believe him, but I also believe my partner. I don't know what to believe. And then he's, like, on this roller coaster ride, and then Scully goes missing. And he's like, well, I'm going to burn it all down. And I think the costume and makeup choice to, like, have him look so sleep-deprived and disheveled was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I think he's very good in this episode. And I like that already, even because this is pretty early, because we get introduced to Skinner at the very end of season one, and then this is pretty early season two, I already like that they're like, no, no, we're Skinner's on our team. <laughs> yeah, is ambiguous. Yeah. He still is in this very middly role, but is like also aligned with them in a right. way that's like clear, in my opinion. Because like, even if Mulder is like, I don't know how I feel about Skinner, like he still goes straight to Skinner. He's like, I have some proof, and like you're the only right. one that I can even remotely kind of trust. And like Skinner, like rewards that trust with like, okay, I'll do what I can. I'm, I'm doing, I'm reopening the X Files because they are afraid, and I'm Team You, I guess, mm-hmm. which I like. I like that a- ambiguity. Yeah, that's something that continues throughout like basically the entire rest of the series. But like you've seen Triangle too, where right. like. The bad guys are the Nazis and like Skinner is presented as a Nazi and then is presented as a defector of the Nazis too, which like that is his whole vibe, the whole series. And I feel like that's kind of like rooted to in this episode. Totally. I mean, it's weird because like so much stuff happens, but also I feel like I don't have a lot to say about it. Yes. It is really interesting. Like I can't, we had talked about like, because you didn't realize that this was a two-parter. Yeah. And then you're that like, well, we mistake. don't know what to do. Should we just watch Dwayne Barry? And I'm like, I'm very glad we decided not to do that because that would have been confusing as fuck. Yeah. They do, you do really need to watch them together. I think that they're good. And I think especially for an alien episode, because we're always like, LOL, the aliens are boring. These ones are pretty interesting. Mm-hmm. But I think that rides mostly on the actor that plays Dwayne Barry because he's fantastic. Mm-hmm. And even for me, without knowing really that much about Crycheck, there it is a good introduction to Crycheck because yes. you kind of like 
get it right away. You know exactly what his vibe is now. Right. He's kind of like slimy at first, but then you also see like he does active deception and then like runs away. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to not watch an order and you're just going to fucking cherry pick, I think it is a good introduction to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't really know what to say about it. I did love the line where he went and saw X and he was like, your predecessor could have helped me. Big Ron could have helped me. (laughs) You little bitch. And he was like, no, Ron couldn't have helped you. Relax. (laughs) Yeah. Because I've kind I've seen X, but I still like don't totally have a vibe for him. Like I, I mean, I know that's kind of the point, but also yeah. like it is weird to watch him specifically randomly. I yeah, think. I mean, but that's kind of how it feels in the series too. Like he just shows up whenever Mulder's like, "I need help." Well, even then, like even when Mulder like calls him and does the X or whatever, like that guy shows up a lot unprovoked and is like, "Yeah, well, you done fucked up. Sorry," and like we'll just straight up like kill people in front of Mulder and is like I'll destroy this evidence there's literally nothing you can do about it like if Skinner is presented in like a light gray way X is like a dark gray right where it's like you clearly work for the cigarette smoking man and we know that and it's really clear but like are you a good guy are you doing this for any reason whatsoever? Well, like, it's, it's really whole thing unclear. That Ron said, and that the cigarette smoking man said in this episode, it's like, well, we indulge him because we can't take him out because then it could be a whole fucking thing. Right. Like, exactly. it is. I know it seems harder, but it's actually easier for us to just fuck around with this one dude. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Can you imagine the lone gunman would be like, we're God, we're on it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And they're right. He would turn into a martyr. Yeah. Like, that's exactly what would happen if they just killed him off. It would be like, oh, everything he said must have been true. Otherwise, why would they have killed him? Right. I'm like, well, it's because everything he said is true, even mm-hmm. though he's fucking crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, this these episodes are very bizarre. Like, this was originally just planned as like a standalone mythology episode for Dwayne Barry. But because... Jillian Anderson was pregnant. They had, they were like, okay, let's make this a two part episode where she gets kidnapped and we can like alien abduct her, which was not originally the plan for her character with a bike tire. (laughs) Yeah. And like, I I do like that you actually get to see her pregnant belly. Like that's like a nice, like cool Jillian Anderson. It's fine. We're not going to like replace you. And like originally the, the studio heads were like upset that she got pregnant, but like, honestly, what the fuck are you going to do about it? But they, Never considered dropping her. And so that's in, that's still like I'm so happy about it. like it's it is incredible to me that that never was a consideration, like especially like the time that this was filmed. Yeah. The, like even like, even now, I feel like if a if a season one brand new TV show regular got pregnant, I feel like they would just write her off. Yeah, absolutely. And like the decision too of we're going to kind of incorporate the fact that she's pregnant but not really. Like, they they banded around a lot of ideas. Like, they originally wanted her to give birth to an alien baby, but they were like, no, that's that takes the show in a totally different direction, yeah. which, like, spoiler, they do kind of return to that. <laughs> but, like, that this changes the series. Like, her being pregnant and them deciding to keep her on as, the, as Fox's partner, like, this impacts the rest of the series going forward. And sometimes not in great ways, but in ways that like, at least it gave them a sense to push forward towards. Like it, it is really incredible that they weren't just like right or off. We'll find somebody else. Yeah. Because this, because she's also not like a huge name or anything right now. No, like, not at all. Like, it's pretty incredible. And like, we talk about this a lot on x that like the whole thing about the X-Files is their relationship. And I think that that was clear at this point, that they were like, okay, we can't just get rid of her and throw someone else in. Like, their dynamic is so particular and specific, especially because the last episode we just covered was Beyond the Sea, and, like, we've already started to establish this, like, very deep bond between them. Like, if they got rid of her and put somebody else in, like, it just wouldn't work. Like, I think the show would have fallen apart, and I think that they understood that intuitively. This episode was nominated for a shitload of Emmys, like a bunch of Emmys. CCH Pounder, who plays the the Warehouse 13 lady, who Mrs. plays the, uh, the hostage negotiation coordinator, she was nominated for Outstanding Guest Actress in a Drama Series. She rules. She was great. Chris Carter was nominated for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Writing for a Drama Series, because these episodes are very well written, mm-hmm, even they if are. they're like kind of bizarre and strange. But for the like bizarreness and the strangeness and like for X-Files, which sometimes where you're like, 
I don't, I can kind of make the jumps that you're making to make this make sense. I'll just retcon a bunch of this in my head and I'll fill in the gaps. This one doesn't need that. Like yeah. it, it does make a logical progressive sense in a way that yeah, totally. is unusual. <laughs> yeah, I would totally agree with that. It was uh, nominated for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Sound Editing for the series, Outstanding Individual Achievement for Editing as a Series Single Camera Production, and the Director of ph- Photography was nominated for Episodic Television by the American Society of Cinematographers, because they made a lot of like really bold filming choices for this, too, because they had to do like the stuff with Dwayne Barry being experimented on, and like him as the Vitruvian Man mm-hmm. with like the drills and all that shit, like the... like. You even said this is one that could still do this on TV, like the flashing lights of the aliens coming through, like, and also the way that the travel agency is lit and how, like, very specific that is. Sort of like in Charlie X, where, like, they had the eye lighting. Like, they did very similar stuff with this with Dwayne Barry and with Mulder, where, like, they are the focus of this scene. And so we're going to light them in this, like, dark but very specific way. I totally understand why people really like glom onto this as like a technical achievement also. And also I agree the sound editing is really fucking good in this, which is really nice. The aliens were all played by small children who had giant masks on. And apparently one of the things the cast and crew commented on later was one of the charming things about this in the end was where they had the aliens heads placed on these young children. It was endearing to see them on set between takes playing with Chris Carter and everybody dressed up (laughs) as aliens, which I think is very cute. David Coveney did all of his own stunts for these episodes, which is insane. What? <laughs> Again, Mulder. I wish David you could Duchovny. have saw my face. I wish we were rec- recording so somebody could have seen my face because that is shocking. Yeah. And maybe they shouldn't have allowed him to do that. Yeah. Uh-huh. I agree. Like, he's fucking dangling off the top of like an actual ski lift tram in the goddamn mountains. He's like, woo, I'm David Duchovny. Like, and I am invincible. He like does some of his own stunts later in the series too. There's like a, in Fight the Future, there's a scene where he like shoots down an ice plume into the ground and he did that stunt himself too, which is really fucking dangerous. And David was like, I insist. I insist on doing this myself. And I'm like, whatever, dude. I guess you can do whatever the fuck you want. This is just like a weird apocrypha note that I found. Originally, the character was named Dwayne Gary, but they had to change it to Dwayne Barry because there was an actual person who worked for the FBI who had that name. And Chris Carter was like, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe not. Maybe we shouldn't make this former FBI agent who goes insane and isn't abducted by aliens uh, have the same name as a real human being. (laughs) So for once, (laughs) Chris Carter was like, all right, pull out the darts. We got to pick a different name. Also, that what did um, I eat for lunch? Mm, Barry, that's fine. Let's do Barry, that. Yeah, that one, that one. <laughs> also, super bizarre. The idea for the holes that were drilled in Dwayne Barry's teeth—that was something that Chris Carter's neighbor said happened to him, and he had like holes drilled in his teeth that, like, by aliens. Apparently, he claimed <laughs> to be an alien abductee, and that what CCH Pounder says about like. There's not technology that can do this. That's what was said about the holes that this guy had in his teeth. And so that's part of why Chris Carter wrote this into this is because he was like, how do you explain this really? And there is no explanation, which is fucking wild. (laughs) Totally bananas. Also, that guy may have just been lying, but like, it is. Yeah, maybe there are ghosts with like tiny little drills. They're like, let's get to teeth out. Let's get to teeth. <laughs> Ghosts eat teeth. <laughs> this episode, again, highly praised by the cast and crew. They This is Chris Carter's first directing episode. This is oh, the first time he like actually directed it. And they really enjoyed working with him. And he said that it made him have a new appreciation for the way that the actors dealt with the scripts that he was writing because now he was understanding like oh there's actually quite a bit that goes into this that like hmm, I should I really should write it all crazy I should start thinking as a writer and a director going into this which like I think going forward too you can kind of see in the way that he writes that he starts to understand more of what he's asking of his directors to do which is right. nice biggest complaints about Ascension were was basically that Krychek was revealed to be a villain too soon in the series but like you you get his vibe right away. You know, you already know he works with Cigarette Smoking Man. Like, it's really clear he's a villain. And also, his shit goes off the rails basically from here. How long is here. he in the series? Until the end. Until the until season nine. And then, oh. yeah. So he comes back many times. Interesting. And he's like interwoven into their gonna lives. That's going to throw him off a balcony. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that does happen. <laughs> All right. I mean. 
People can survive crazy things. Yeah, yeah we'll get to it. <laughs> We're going to build you a mini arc of between seasons that I'm going to include that episode so okay. you can get some extra Skinner and also you can like figure out what's going on with Crycheck. Crycheck's relationship with Mulder is very specific and then with Scully is very specific, but his relationship with Skinner is very specific in a way that is like, You already hate him. You're going to hate him so much fucking more once you know the intricacies of his relationship with Skinner. It's very antagonistic. Right. (laughs) One of the other things I found that I thought was interesting, Chris Carter said that one of the things that the censors and the producers were really reluctant about was showing Scully in the trunk of the car, but that he fought really hard for that image because he said that it was important to convey the sense of danger that the character was in. But like you were saying, like, that's not great. Having a person in the trunk of your car, aren't they supposed to be able to get out? And like at the time, no, you couldn't right. escape from a car trunk at that time. And it was something that did happen to women. And Carter really fought for it and was like, if a woman is being abducted, this is what happens. And like, this is really important. I think part of it too was that the producers knew she was pregnant and they were like, this is really uncomfortable. <laughs> we're shoving this pregnant woman in the trunk of a car. But I feel like it's so important, especially to Ascension, that visual of her and the way that it drives Mulder going forward, like without that very drives strong, crazy. yeah, without that like strong sense of she's alive and I know she's in the trunk of this car. Like, I don't think he would have climbed on the top of a moving tram. Like, right. I think that this pushes him in an appropriate way in that direction. Also, it's so funny when like you hear about, oh, the censors want to allow that just to see like what was like, ooh, in the 90s and like what's on TV now. Yeah, <laughs> like, for sure. Down our SVU's like hitting its like 500th episode. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> and the scenes with the experiment with the bicycle pump on her tummy, like they shot them to be very ambiguous so that it's, is it aliens? Is it the military? Is it both? And like that question goes on for seasons. And like they, there is a resolution, but like kinda and like they yeah it's like a jerk off resolution in many ways but like the fact that they shot it in this ambiguous way gave them all this leeway to like really tease this out for several seasons after this which I really like and then just one final note on Apocrypha that Scully comes in and she talks about how Dwayne Barry was shot in the head and there's this case of Phineas Gage where he was a railroad worker who had a railroad spike driven completely through his head and it fucked up his frontal cortex. That's real. Yeah, that's I a, knew that. Yeah, that's a real person. That's a real thing that happened. That guy survived. I feel like that is brought up in a lots of pop culture stuff. Yeah. It's just like an interesting, scary because fact. it's like you can't do that experiment on somebody. And so the fact that somebody survived it and then you can like mark down because all not everything she says is true like there there's no evidence that he became a pathological liar there's no evidence that like he became certain types of violent but he did have massive personality changes yeah, and of like a yeah stake in your head he had like a lobotomy basically and people so, have massive personality changes if they hit their head too hard well yeah that's what i was gonna say too is that Phineas gage is also one of the like foundational pieces of like serial killer pathology education because most serial and spree killers go through a traumatic brain event that damages their frontal cortex. And like this case is then cited. Like we know that it has very specific complications that come from this kind of damage too. And so I like the, that's what Chris Carter based this off of. He was like, I know about Phineas Gage. I'm going to write a whole episode around this shit. And the fact that it spirals out into this monstrosity, I think is just really fascinating. That's it. That's all we have to say about these episodes. We didn't even talk about the red hot pants in the X Files one. His dick is out. Yeah, it just is like a quick thing about that. This is at the beginning of the series. They were like, "What sports can we make Mulder play?" And this is swimming is the only one that makes sense. Well, he like plays a bunch of basketball. Oh, and he likes baseball. He likes baseball. He runs a lot, but this is the only time we ever see him swimming. He that never comes back. We see him in uh, the Scully, and Scully meet the werewolf, meet the, were- meet the, meet were- the were- monster. Monster. Yeah, he's like on the bed sleeping in his red speedo, and like this is the callback. Yeah, for that's that. when we started to make the joke about this theme. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we were like, wait a minute, let's do this. Theme. Actually, let's do this. <laughs> but yeah, it's just that like super short shot of Krychek walking with him in the pool, and he's like, "Here's my whole dick. <laughs> Here I am. I'm really hot. I'm David Duchovny in the '90s, dick." <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ready for Synopsis Showdown? Sure. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, ours are going to be very different. Yeah, they are. All right. Dwayne Barry kidnaps and holds hostage a bunch of people in order to avoid being abducted by aliens. The FBI, with some of the worst judgment of all time, sends in Mulder, who immediately makes it worse, eventually leading to Scully's abduction by both Dwayne Barry and aliens. Mulder, driven by sleep deprivation and grief, bonds with Skinner, outs Crychick as a little bitch, and then goes and cries on a mountain. Alien abductions are just hostage situations without anyone to negotiate the release of the victims. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. That's perfect. (laughs) Are you ready for a deep throat submission log? I am. Hey, Sam. Let me borrow you for a couple of easy throws, huh? Right. So starting with Charlie X, uh, this story is by Gene himself. Mm-hmm. It was one of Roddenberry's babies. It was also one of the like sentence to two sentence synopsis stories that he had before he started working on the show. Right. That was a lot of the first season. But the teleplay is by DC Fontana. Yes. Yeah. This um, this was directed by Lawrence Dobkin, who is also an Emmy nominated actor as well as being a director and occasional writer and producer. His Emmy nomination was for Outstanding Performance by an Actor in a Supporting Role in a Drama for CBS Playhouse. Interesting in Trek with him is 25 years later, he guests in TNG as the Klingon ambassador Kel in the episode The Mind's Eye. Interesting. It's one big happy family. Yeah. And by happy family, I mean not that happy family here at Star Trek. No. (laughs) He started his career actually on radio plays in the 40s through the 60s, including the titular character on The Saint. His most known for his screen roles in Patton, Mike Hammer, and Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments, and a lot of TV like Gunsmoke, The Rifleman, Naked City, L.A. Law, and Melrose Place, both as judge characters. His other directing credits include multiple episodes of The Rifleman, 77 Sunset Strip, The Munsters, The Donna Reed Show, Emergency, Fantasy Island, and The Waltons. Notable in their absence is James Duhan and George Takei. However, they do use two words spoken by George Takei in The Man Trap when Kirk calls from the bridge to the gymnasium. After Charlie transforms Tina Lawton into an iguana, the noise the reptile makes was that of the sound made by Sylvia and Korob when they return to their true forms at the end of Cat's Paw. It's the same sound. Of course he's the same sound. Why not? In Gene Roddenberry's one-sentence synopsis for the show that DC Fontana then filled out, the original title was The Day Charlie Became a God. And also for a while during production, this episode was called Charlie's Law. It was said that Charlie's Law was, you'd better be nice to Charlie or else. (laughs) Didn't James Blish like put that in the novelization a bunch too? Yeah. 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 Because that was what they were working with at the time. And a lot of times Blish was just working off those early notes. I got to start on these now. (laughs) We'll jump to some casting notes. That is Dallas Mitchell as Nellis. From 56 to 82, amassed 59 guest TV credits, including Men Into Space, Have Gun Will Travel, Asphalt Jungle, Man From Uncle, Mod Squad, and The Rockford Files. That is Charles J. Stewart as Captain Ramart. After this plays Clergyman in two Batman episodes. Not a clergyman, clergyman. Clergyman. Guests on the FBI, Brady Bunch, Joni Loves Chachi, (laughs) and has a credit as Vacuum Chamber Tech in Armageddon. Like the Bruce Willis Armageddon. That movie slaps. I could stay awake just to hear you. Okay, anyways. <sighs> that was another one of the movies that I would watch over and over again, and I'd be like, I just love Liv Tyler. I don't know why. <laughs> no now gay we stuff. Now we know. <laughs> no gay stuff. <laughs> Seen briefly as the apparitional Thasian is Abraham Sofair. I think it's Sofair or Sofair. He's also in Spectre of the Gun as the voice of Melcott. He was born in Rangoon, Burma, and then transitioned from transitioning to the stage from being a school teacher, where he was a walk-on in a 1921 production of The Merchant of Venice, and then went on to have a highly distinguished career in British stage before going to film in the 50s and TV in the 60s, and then retiring in 74 with a career of 144 credits. Oh. He was, you can't tell, but he he is of color. He looks very, very Indian. So he took on a lot of those early Indian roles, then some native roles as well getting work as a person of color at that time as you do 
That is Patricia McNulty as Tina Lawton. She has 10 acting credits, including this and Tammy Tell Me True and My Three Sons. She also has an editing credit for a 2005 Avril Lavigne tour movie. What? What? (laughs) Truly one of the most (laughs) random IMDb twists I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) Granted, this is 2000. Is this before? Okay. (laughs) So it's like, is this actual Avril Lavigne or is this like the imposter who is playing Avril Lavigne? This is 2005. So like. I don't know where that timeline is supposed I to be. It's right around that. Yeah. It's right around the change, right? Because it was supposed to be Avril's first two albums. Oh, no. For anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, um, I guess look up Avril Levine body double conspiracy theory and it's have yourself just a good time. Theory. No, it's I believe it's real. It's, <laughs> it's, fully and completely. It's conspiracy fact, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this isn't Birds Aren't Real. This is actually Avril Lavigne was replaced by a body double. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd you have to go and make everything so complicated? That brings us to Robert Walker as Charlie X, Charles Evans. At the filming of this, when he was 17 years old as a character, he is 26 years old. Oh. So he has a baby face yeah. and body. And he got and a, just a big head. Yeah. And just a really one of the biggest heads right. I've ever seen. Right. And so you can imagine he got a lot of work as an actor, especially younger and leading up to that in Hollywood because he was so old and could play so young. Also method. Also very method. Oh, did you mention that? In I yours? did that. Okay. My note says, Charlie, the actor who plays Charlie is method. Vom. <laughs> The story from that on this episode is he tried to work method this episode by isolating himself on set from the cast. Cool, bye. So that (laughs) when he was around them, he had that kind of like manic, desperate energy. I mean, it worked. Connecting with them at all. Yeah, it works, but also be an an actor. actor. Be an actor. Act. Yeah, act. He is the son of actor Robert Walker and Academy Award winning actress Jennifer Jones. So he started acting training very early in his life and made his film debut in 63 opposite Kirk Douglas in The Hook and also starred in the ceremony in which he received a Golden Globe Award for Promising Newcomer. TV appearances include The Defender, Bonanza, Dallas, Murder, She Wrote, and several more films. He left acting in 1993. In 97, he was approached for a role in a Star Trek DS9 episode six season, but he was not interested in renewing his acting career at the time, according to Iris Stephen Bear. Bear remembered when I lived in Malibu, Robert Walker Jr. ran a store there and I used to see him on occasion. I used to think, oh my God, it's Charlie X. That probably means in 97, he probably looked a lot like he still did back in the 60s. I mean, he has the Haley Joel Osment s- syndrome where it's like your face just looks the same. Yeah. Or maybe. Walter Koenig, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. R- really, honestly, yes. However, he does have some more recent credits in 2017 and 2018, so I think he's back acting. The thing that he made in 2018 was like a big... It looked like one of those Christian action movies oh. where it's like angels and devils fighting and it it might be connected Strange. with some religious cult. I don't know. Do they kiss? I don't know. <laughs> Do they angels and the demons kiss? No, I kiss? think it's made by actual religious people. That does not mean Yeah, they I was about to kiss. say, the Bible is wild. <laughs> <laughs> True, the Bible is wild. <laughs> yeah. That will bring us to Dwayne Barry and Ascension. As Aaron mentioned, Dwayne Barry was written and directed by Chris Carter, and this is Carter's directorial debut. He says himself that he worked extensively with David Nutter, who we just talked about last episode, getting ready to be a director and how to be a director. And in Carter's words, he followed Nutter's advice down to the letter. So helped out a lot just with how to conceptualize shots and guide actors through that process. Ascension is written by Paul Brown and directed by Michael Lang. So there's a writer and director change between these two episodes as well. You can kind of see that more in how casting is handled, which I'll get to in a little bit. Paul Brown also pens Chelsea's Day and produces nine episodes of The X-Files, as well as writing 13 episodes and producing 64 episodes of Quantum Leap. He also writes the Voyager episode Child's Play and both Camp Rock movies. (laughs) 
Director Michael Lang has 93 TV directing credits, including four episodes of X-Files, four Buffy's, 13 90210s, seven Dawson's Creeks, 13 of the OC, 33 episodes of Greek, seven episodes of Bones. And getting episodes of the OC. That's a change. <laughs> I mean, it was all of those. It was Dawson's Creek, the OC, Greek. Like, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. Getting into some lore fan stuff for me, as for Dwayne Barry, David Duchovny declared that Mulder wears the acclaimed Speedo in the scene at the pool at the suge- at his suggestion to Chris Carter. Chris Carter wanted of him to course. wear maybe a fuller swimsuit. and <laughs> Let me show my dick, Chris. <laughs> Mulder was like, <laughs> Duchovny was like, Mulder wants that dong out. Yeah. <laughs> he knows Crycheck's coming. He needs to assert dominance. That's not a real quote. That's just my head cannon. <laughs> also, again, David Duchovny, not stupid, knows women and gays watch the show. <laughs> you know, Shatner was like, I'll not be wearing the gi. I'll be taking this part off. <laughs> oh, this gi is so itchy. I I think I'll just <laughs> when it flies off of him, Bruce Almighty style. <laughs> <laughs> that was me doing Shatner nipples, <laughs> <laughs> nipple lasers. Um, speaking of lasers, <laughs> lasers. A note from Ascension is that that barcode segment that Scully later scans in the supermarket had maybe two dozen bars and was described as being ten microns across. Although, of course, normal barcodes are much larger. The red light used in the scanners has a wavelength of about 0.633 microns, so it's possible that it would scan it. It's possible that, like, the supermarket scanner would pick that up. The 90s loved a barcode. Yeah. I mean, that's how they track shit. Also, microchips. Dana's pickles and ice cream, which is a joke about her being pregnant. Oh, oh, that's such an obvious job. I didn't even realize that's what she was buying. That's so ridiculous. That she writes a check for. Yeah, I was 11, gonna say gets real to the max of eleven fourteen, and Dana Scully writes a fucking check. It was the nineties. The they wrote checks for everything. I love how the clerk looks at it only briefly and is like, "Yeah, it's eleven dollars." <laughs> Everyone writes fucking checks. Keep it. <laughs> Starting to get into the casting notes for both of these, which I tried to cut down because God, there's just a lot. So I will start with Tim Dixon, who appears as Bob in this episode and would go on to play Dr. R.W. Godfrey in Syzygy. He's also in Lake Placid and plays a priest in the Supernatural episode, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? What season? I'd have to look that up. I'm looking it up. Okay. (laughs) Don't worry, I'm on it. And recently he voiced a character called Dr. No, N-O-H, on the obvious Transformers knockoff kids show, Tobot or Tobot, T O B O T. I don't know. It looked very Canadian. Okay. I'm not there yet. It's season 11. Okay, okay. so you have that to look forward to. <laughs> the Dwayne Berry, I believe you girls, character's name is Kimberly, and she's played by someone named Sarah Strange, who has just come into a lot of prominence currently in her career. Also, She's my surprise voice actor for this Yay! episode. She voices Ranma Saotome in all of Ranma One Half, which is an anime. And also Franklin on Dino Babies. Live action, she does return guest roles on Madison, Outer Limits, Poltergeist, Da Vinci and Quest, Life as We Know It, Regenesis. Was Morgan Le Fay in the direct-to-video Stargate, the Ark of Truth movie. And recently voices Lachesis on DC Legends of Tomorrow and plays Suzanne on the Snowpiercer TV series that's oh, running wow. right now. That is, once again, Fred Henderson, this time as Agent Rich. <laughs> we talked about him last episode as playing a different Agent Bit character. Moving on to some Ascension smaller acting roles. That's Bobby Stewart as the deputy. We see him in War of the Corporophages as resident number two. He's the, the person of color, the black deputy. Before being on this and during the start of his acting career, he studied for four years at the William B. Davis Center for Performing Arts hey. and then got to be in an episode with William B. Davis. That's cool. So pretty like, fucking cool. Fuck yeah for him. That's got to be dope. Yeah, that'd feel pretty fucking cool. <laughs> also has guest role credits on The Commish, seven episodes of Madison, Outer Limits, Dark Angel, and Prison Break. Speaking of barcodes, Dark Angel. <laughs> <laughs> As the patrolman who we see uh, try to pull over Barry and then get very shot, that is Stephen Makaj, or Makaj, M-A-K-A-J. We also see him in Redux. So this is getting into what I said, like, the casting difference. Dwayne Barry, you see a lot of, like, 
people that we've never seen before in the series and we usually don't see again. A lot of Ascension is a lot of people who work a bunch of X-Files episodes and come back to like different X-Files series as well. The tram operators in a different episode. Yep. Yeah. So Stephen Mikaj, that patrolman, he is also Steve Osselhoff in Redux and Getzmane. He is Frank Kavit in DPO, and he is a uncredited man in black in Deep Throat. He's also in the Lone Gunman pilot and Colonel Makepeace in five episodes of SG-1 and plays Ben's father in the IT TV miniseries. Ben Lapras plays very the- very excited. <laughs> What's that? Ben, who's my sweet baby. <laughs> yeah. No spoilies. No spoilies. Um, ben Lapras, who plays the video tech, again, is also Harry Linhart in the episode Born Again and has 18 credits as an assistant production coordinator as well. So he's double dipping in his career smartly. That is Peter Lacroix as Dwight, the tram operator, which Aaron said also plays Frank Druce in EBE, Nathaniel Teeger in Unrequited, and also has guest roles in SG-1 Smallville, Sliders, The Sentinel, North of 60, and Continuum. The Sentinel? The Sentinel. I need to start mentioning The Sentinel more because- Yeah, I love The Sentinel. It's on a lot of these people's resumes as well. Mention it more. I will. I will. I will. I will. (laughs) People need to know about the joys of The Sentinel. Hopefully if I say, we say The Sentinel enough, people are like, keep hearing about this. The Sentinel show. Not we the, should check it not out. Not the movie oh. with Keeper Sutherland. No, not the Keeper Sutherland <laughs> movie. Everything that you like, like any fanfic that you that I read or that people read, like there is a really good Sentinel version where one of those characters is a guide and one of them is a Sentinel. Like, whew, I love the Sentinel trope. That is <laughs> that is Meredith Bain Woodward as Dr. Ruth Slaughter. Yes. That woman who Mulder talks to once and is doing the autopsy as a military person and not an FBI person's name is Dr. Ruth Slaughter. Love it. Thanks, Chris Carter. (laughs) She also plays the defense attorney in Pusher, which is like a really prominent role in that episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God damn, I knew she looked familiar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also has roles on the Heights and the new Adams Family. That is Frank C. Turner as the very, very captive Dr. Hackey. He also plays Dr. Collins in Tombs. He's a skinny, beardy character actor who's done a bunch of things like that. Like he was Willy on the Magical World of Disney, return roles on Wise Guy and MacGyver, Al March on the It TV series. He's uh-huh. Bev. Wait, he's like Bev's dad? Yes. Oh, creepy. That was another oh weird connection. Oh my God. Yeah, I yeah. never would have realized that For was the context, same person. because this is coming out months later, we're recording this in October, and me and Aaron are both reading It. So, like, all of these it references are us being like, (laughs) Yeah. He also plays Pete Jerks in Needful Things. He's in This Boy's Life. He's on Bob Finch on Lonesome Dove. Frack Palmer on Call of the Wind. Outer Limits, Smallville. And most recently was Crazy Carl in the Sonic the Hedgehog movie. (laughs) Lots of Sonic references these last two episodes. (laughs) It's weird, but, like, again, depending on where that movie was shot, which I'm guessing maybe Canada, because of the crossover, a lot of these people are newer actors and they're still working. That's Stephen E. Miller as the tactical commander who's working with CCH Pounder that whole time. He's also in Piper Maru as Wayne Morgan. He's in Pilot as Coroner Truitt and the feed store proprietor in I Want to Believe. He's also in 12 episodes of Millennium as AD Andy McLaren. So he has a long TV career as well and shows like Danger Bay, 21 Jump Street. He was in Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed, Da Vinci's Inquest. He was also a writer for two seasons of the Romeo section and also an accomplished novelist who won an international three-day novel contest with a book called Wastefall, which led to subsequent novels that he's still writing and selling now. On stage, he's acting in more than 40 plays. And yeah, just seems like a very successful Canadian B-level actor. That brings us to Steve Railsback, who plays Dwayne Barry. God, he was good. What a name. (laughs) So good. After seeing him play Charles Manson in the 76 Helter Skelter, that imprinted in Chris Carter's mind. And he wrote the part of Dwayne Barry specifically with Railsback in mind. Perfectly well cast. Fantastic. He's so good. He comes from the Strasbourg School and has an extensive stage career starting in the New York theater scene in the late 60s and early 70s, becoming known for that intensity. I specifically sought out that 2000 Ed Guy movie because it was him in it. And he's also really good in that. Yeah, he'd be really good as that character. That guy's creepy as fuck. 
His earlier film credits include a From Here to Eternity TV miniseries, The Stuntman, Life Force, Trick or Treats, Armed and Dangerous with John Candy and Eugene Levy, 13 episodes of The Visitor, Barbed Wire, The Devil's Rejects, recently Dr. Durea on Femme Fatales, and Victor Dusang in It Wants Blood. He also played Joseph Welch in the pilot episode of Supernatural. I just broke Stell's brain a little bit. She's trying to remember who the hell that is. Yeah, it's just like yeah. so long ago. The in my pilot head. episode, and you're just like, oh my God, how far have I come? <laughs> Too far. Nope, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> He's considered by many who work with him to be extremely underappreciated and try as he might to like break out of those serial characters. Most of his work has been on home movie slash B level horror stuff, but he is very good. Mm -hmm. I love the scene where he's hooting and hollering and laughing at the top of the mountain. When I was watching it to prep, I was like, yeah, I can see why you played Charles Manson. This is creepy as fuck. On paper, this could have fallen flat. The Yeah, it looks exactly the fucking same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's shown Supernatural. How he is written, how Dwayne Barry is written as a character with the name repetition and the outbursts and all of that, you could very easily overdo that to the point where it comes out as comedic. And it know, does not. <laughs> you know right away this is somebody with something wrong with them, with something very specific wrong with them. Yeah. And I chose to end this talking about CCH Pounder. Yeah. Uh, on top of her Emmy nomination for this, which Aaron talked about, she also gets Emmy nominations for guest roles on ER, The Shield, and the number one ladies detective agency. Also, a bunch of award nominations everywhere else, but only two wins and both for image awards. Someone please give this woman her flowers. Also seen in five episodes of Millennium as the character Cheryl Andrews. She was born on Christmas Day in 1952 in Guyana, then went to a Covent boarding school in Britain, then in New York went to Ithaca College and started regional and classical repertory theater, earning roles in productions such as The Mighty Gents with Morgan Freeman at the New York Shakespeare Festival and Open Admissions, her Broadway debut. Her other stage work includes roles in Coriolanus, Antony and Cleopatra, The Frog, The Lodger, and Mumbo Jumble. Film-wise, she one of her first notable roles is starting as Nurse Blake in All That Jazz, Postcards from the Edge, The Importance of Being Earnest, an all-black version of The Importance of Being Earnest, in which she plays Miss P Prism, Benny and June, Interesting. I Robo like that casting. You should, like, I want to seek that out after reading that. Yeah. Yeah. Benny and June, Robocop 3, Sliver, Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight, which is awesome and you should watch. Face Off, Funny Valentines, and she is a voice in the Avatar movies and will also be in like all of the five sequels that they're right. concurrently filming for. It. And My Girlfriend's Back. But her TV career, though. <laughs> Iconic roles in Women in Prison, Cop Rock, L.A. Law, Return to Lonesome Dove, ER, The Shield, Brothers, Law & Order SVU, Warehouse 13, which Stel has mentioned a bunch this if episode. If you have not watched Warehouse 13, what the fuck are you doing? Watch Warehouse 13. It's available on Amazon. What Look out. I put like Warehouse 13 and Eureka are two shows that are like undervalued in sci-fi, but they're, they're the both perfect so amount of lore and fan service and everything. Do not get sucked into alphas, though. No, don't. <laughs> also notable roles for CCH Pounder, uh, Sons of Anarchy, NCIS New Orleans, as well as cartoon voice work on shows like Biker Mice from Mars. She was Desdemona on Gargoyles. In Rocket Power, she was the mayor on Static Shock. She played Amanda Waller on the Justice League Unlimited series and really crafted great casting everyone else who plays that character now is kind of doing a version of that and the aforementioned avatar films so she's badass she rules she yeah. should have more accolades and absolutely killed it in this episode oh yeah she was really good yeah yeah that perfect yeah kind of that perfect narrow line of being authoritative but listening mm -hmm. making the right decisions everything yeah as of right now i'm reopening the x-files that's what they fear the most all right now for our overall thoughts 
Um, these episodes tied together because they were wearing little hot red pants. <laughs> and also they're like weirdly dark. They're Both very of them dark. Were weirdly dark. Both of them had like main male characters who are not conditioned well to society. Mm-hmm. They also technically both have alien abductions. Yeah, I guess you're right. They yeah. do. <laughs> Good observation. <laughs> I got you back. <laughs> yeah, for us being like, oh, red hot pants is such a funny theme. These are like fucking very serious episodes. Yes. Yeah, they kind of tie together. Yeah, in like weird ways that we weren't expecting. Also, I like that both the red hot pants scenes are very short. And like that, the Star Trek one is admittedly much longer. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be hard to be shorter than like 15 seconds of David Duchovny's ass and then his dick and then it's over. <laughs> and yet both of those short scenes are very prominent in fandom and fandom yeah. communities and are referenced again throughout them. So like totally it seems like a thin premise, but is actually very held together. Mm-hmm, yes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Cause this you. podcast is about fandom. That makes sense. Thank you, Bobby. It's- <laughs> good, at, good at podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> now for our casual fan questionnaire, as a casual fan, would you recommend this episode to a newbie? I don't know. I'm honestly not sure. It was so weird, but it's also the second episode. And yeah. so it's like... It's weird to not recommend the second episode, but... Yeah, like, you you could drop into this episode, definitely, but I think you definitely need, like, the, like, asterisks of, like, this is more of a horror episode than yeah. it is, like, a typical... If someone asked me for a Star Trek recommendation, this is not what I would give them. No. But if someone was like, hey, I'm going to watch a Star Trek episode, this is the one that's on, I'd be like, well... Like, Sure, yeah, There's you can absolutely drop in with no other knowledge. You just should be prepared for the creepiest kid of all fucking time. I feel like I, I don't know, because it's... Some people like to write off Star Trek TOS really easily, like, oh, it's from the 60s, it's unwatchable, there's so many problematic things about it, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like this is one that if somebody half paid attention to, they would be like, ew, gross, 60s. But like, you, if you really actually pay attention to it, you're like, it's actually pretty nuanced. So like, they yeah. have a whole ass conversation about like consent. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think I would personally recommend it to a newbie, but it's also weird because it's episode two. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I don't have a good answer. Would you recommend no! these? Okay. <laughs> I think you could show this to somebody new with no context because you kind of get a pretty good idea of who Mulder is specifically yeah. in these. And also, if you have no idea what their relationship is, this establishes the relationship. I don't know. I just feel like it would be overwhelming. I don't think it yes. would turn somebody off necessarily because like, everybody's very in character and it is a uniquely complete like story with an open-ended thing like what's gonna happen to scully like it is not an off-putting thing but i just feel like it would be overwhelming and you would be like i feel like i'm bogged down is this the whole show is this this much yes (laughs) that's the thing though like it kind of is it is and it isn't though yeah and it's definitely more of the alien bent than like a lot of the episodes that we watch for extracts too so it's it's like a weird i don't they're both kind of like you could, but you probably shouldn't. Yeah, I I personally would not start with either of these episodes, but like someone who's seen half a dozen episodes of both shows, like, yeah, I sure. could definitely see the being like, hey, I'm thinking about watching Dwayne Barry. Like, yeah, you should definitely watch Dwayne Barry. Or like, hey, Charlie X is on. Can, should I watch this episode? Like, yeah, you probably should. Yeah. Like, especially like you were saying, because it is uh, – surprisingly progressive for the 60s so yeah like yes but with a very large asterisk for both of them all three episodes really (laughs) yeah what is the scene or moment from this episode that you won't forget i think bones pulling janice back at the end it's very short it was just like that one moment of him like i'm glad you noticed it too because i like i'm always like yeah that's a good acting choice yeah it's just such a good moment and like one of the good things about i think part partly one of the reasons we've watched a lot of these like bottle episodes that are are like ship containment ones is because they really highlight the crew and their camaraderie and i thought that was a you don't really ever see bones and rand interact in that way and so it was nice to have this like very brief moment of the humanity between the two of them as crewmates. So I think that will probably stick with me. Yeah, Bones is a grumpy old asshole, but he also like deeply cares about everybody on that ship. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a good moment. What are you going to remember? <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> 
Honestly, probably this the scene where Mulder loses it and chokes Dwayne Barry. Yeah. I feel like that is a moment where he like he's really having this like internal struggle with himself and that's just a really good acting moment for him. Mm-hmm. Cuz Mulder's like chaotic and whatever, but that's like this weird violent moment and feels out of character, but totally in character because he would like he's so worried about Scully, mm-hmm. and um, he leaves. He like right. realizes what he's doing and is like, "I have to leave this I room, have to walk away, or from I this. will kill this man." Right. Also, I guess we probably both should have said the red hot pants. Well, yeah, but that's <laughs> that's different. <laughs> Who are you shipping? Anybody? I don't know. This wasn't like a sexual episode yeah. in any so early, and yeah, also not really. It's like a friendship ship. I liked the way Uhura and Spock interacted with this. Totally. I, I can see why lots of people friendship ship them going forward, especially in the alternate universe. Well, they don't friendship ship them in the alternate universe. They well, no. ship ship them. No, I mean like the writers ship ship oh, them. Yeah. But like people, fandom interacts with them as like, no, they're actually just best friends. We yeah, all know that besties. he's a gay. It's cool. So that, I can see the like pinnings of that. But like romantically... No, nobody. Also, I like Janice and Uhura's friendship in this. Yeah, I would agree. This like is a good friends episode, yeah. but like, it's not sexual in like any way. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea that it's so early because you do have a lot of good like triumvirate powwow like friend moments in this mm-hmm. episode. Like you can see really early on that Kirk relies very heavily on these two men. Mm-hmm. You see the beginnings. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Foundational. Would you ship anybody in either of these episodes? No, but it is, like, again, one of those moments where it's, like, I feel like if I were watching this in order, this would be one of those moments where it's, like, oh, he loves her. Yeah. This is a one-sided, like, love right now. And it's, like, oh, he'll do anything for her. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is very important. So it's, like, it's a pre-ship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both of these seem very Mm pre-shippy. Weird. Another weird way to tie these two bizarre sets of episodes together. Pre-ship. Pre-ship. Though I gotta be honest, when they were Skinner and Mulder were in the office together, I was like, maybe I'm gonna look up some Skinner Mulder fic tonight. <laughs> it's been a while. Can we revisit that? Both of them look very handsome in this yeah, episode. Yeah, they were very handsome in this episode. Yes. Mm-hmm. Is it a fuck fine or a flat? Fine plus. Yeah. I think a fine plus. Again, it's so much more nuanced than I was expecting, but like, you wouldn't like wanna go out of your way to watch it. No, definitely right. not. And it's. It's creepy. It's It's scary. It's a scary episode psychologically and also like scary. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Are these fuck fine or flat? Uh, Fuck minus. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. I feel like the two combinations of the episodes too. It's like they're they're very different episodes also. But But they they do flow nicely. Yeah, they make this like cohesive whole and they're both really important overall for like the long term mythology for the show. But they are weird and overwhelming. (laughs) All right, that's it. That's it. You can find us on the internet. You can follow us at NYD Productions on Twitter and interact with the show using the hashtag XTrexPod. You can find me at NYD Urgency on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter at Stella underscore Cheeks. And you can find me on Twitter at Haberdasher9K. You can also email us at XTrexPod at gmail.com with questions or comments. I have a bevy of links <laughs> with uh, these pants and also a lot of stretching and uh, sparring in the gym that just gets a little too close. <laughs> also, I'm sure you're going to have plenty of Mulder Skinner fix after this as well. Yeah, I got lots of sexy links. Lots of sexy links. <laughs> I'm reopening the X-Files and your pants. <laughs> if you want to, please speak it on the floor. <laughs> You want to make me happy, get on the floor. If you want to make me happy, get on the floor. Mulder. Okay. I feel like I have read that fic. There's a lot of dumb stuff stuff between the two of them. That's not surprising. (laughs) Not at all. Anyways, off the rails. And if this episode was somehow not extensive enough for you and you want more details like our script notes and outtakes from this, as well as behind the scenes action like extra podcasts and access to our discord where Stell tends to drop a lot of the links she mentions on this show you could check out our patreon at patreon.com slash nyd productions where you can get access to all that and more for only a dollar and don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and to tell your friends we find that this nerdy shit is better when it's shared we'll see you next time for the I've been framed episode In the meantime, believe boldly, seek truth, ship proudly. 
Extracts is created and written by Stella Cheeks, Aaron Klein, and Bobby Hoffman, and produced by Bobby Hoffman for NYD Productions. Our show theme is Alien Spy by Ionix, and our show art was made by Jonathan Curtis. Here I am, I'm really hot, I'm David Duchovny in the 90s. Dick, 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 dick.